Please give a warm G Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Sarah Morrison. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and welcome on this warm, sunny day uh, to come out and listen to this talk. So I, I appreciate your time. I want to have this be very informal. So if you have any questions uh, throughout this presentation, just raise your hand and I'll stop and we can answer the question. When I was asking about what to put into this presentation, I said, well, do you want my story? Do you want uh, the story of Shepard or where Shepard's going to go in the future? And the answer was yes. So this may be a hot mess because it's kind of all over the place, but um, we will still plan on ending on time. I may have to rush through some certain things if I'm not through some of the um, slides. But anyway, so please feel free to interrupt at any time and we'll go from there. So my journey, I am one of six kids, I'm number five, so I am truly the forgotten one. I mean, I'm worse than a middle child. I mean, when you get to the fifth one, I think I had two baby pictures, uh, but that's okay. Uh, my father was an Episcopal minister, my mother was a special ed teacher, and uh, so we grew up in uh, Fredonia, New York, which is upstate New York, about 60 miles southwest of Buffalo. And I stayed there, um, when I turned 13, I was on the YMCA swim team. And I think, and before I say this, I think what you're going to find out when I'm telling you my story, I didn't pursue, I didn't have a career of being CEO at Shepherd Center. I didn't even know Shepherd Center existed. Uh, but just things just happened that I took advantage of. So you'll, you'll hear this across uh, the way in the times when I'm talking through my journey. But when I was 13, I was in the YMCA swim club, and the coach asked, hey, does anybody want to try diving? We have everybody in every single event, but no, no diver. Uh, so we would like our team to be represented at the state championship diving. Who wants to try it? Well, stupid me. Raise my hand. <clears throat> and I had about a month and a half to get ready <laughs> to learn how to dive. But you know, yeah, you mess mess with things when you uh, get to a friend's pool or something like that that has a diving board. So I did that and lo and behold I went to uh, the state championship and I won it. I know, right? <clears throat> I was like, what? <laughs> well everybody was like, what? What happened? Uh, it's really cute with my little bathing cap. And uh, so I won that state competition. So my family started thinking, huh, maybe she has a talent in this. Now, mind you, I was also afraid of heights, so diving really should not have been the thing that I did. And what happened was I went to my, when I was 15, I started the Fredonia Hillbillies, I was on their diving team, and I won state as a freshman by less than one point. My mother was a nervous wreck. Uh, she was taking the scores and grinding her pencil into that paper, but I did come in first place. And then in my sophomore year, I went to the state championship again and won by more than 100 points. So it was at this time my family said, well, she's done pretty much everything she can do now. Let's ship her off to Miami. Uh, we're sick of her by now. But, uh, so I left home when I was 16 to live with a family. Who's, he was a cardiac surgeon to train at the, well, at Miami. And while I was there, I also, when I was about 17 and a half, graduated high school early, so I started when I was about 17 and a half with a full scholarship at the University of Miami. And while I was there, remember I'm afraid of heights, right? So high school, the diving board is only like this, this high. So that was pretty good. I, I could tolerate that. But what happened when I went to Florida is you had the three meter springboard and then you had the 10 meter platform, the one that's like 33 and a third feet up. My, I, if you could come up and feel my palms right now, it's just sweating, thinking about climbing up that ladder. It was horrible. And through repetitive diving, repetitive backward bending, I did one dive off the 10 meter platform. It was the first time I was gonna do it. It was a back two and a half. And I landed wrong. And my back was just never the same after that. Had chronic pain, uh, come to find out through a lot of the things that I probably did wrong as a diver. I had a stress fracture in my back, so I broke my back and needed it to get fixed. Now, luckily, I didn't have any neurological damage, 
But this is kind of where physical therapy started coming into my mind as far as a career. I had surgery and I was in a body cast at the University of Miami in Florida for nine months. Could not take it off. Has anybody smelled an arm cast that's only been on for a couple weeks? Yeah, I was a walking skunk. It was horrible. <laughs> I was in physical therapy school at the time, uh, just starting, and the professors just remind, uh, remember me standing in the back because I couldn't sit down. Because uh, the body cast went from my chest down to my knee on my right side, my hip on the left. So I could bend my left leg a little bit. But everything I had to do was standing. I couldn't, I couldn't ride a bike, I couldn't get in a car, um, unless it was a station wagon in the back and that was a mess too. Um, so after nine months, I did get back into diving, but uh, I lost a lot of flexibility, if you can even imagine. But that's where um, I started my career, uh, or wanting to start my career as a physical therapist. So when I graduated physical therapy school, um, I knew my, my future husband, he was not my husband yet, was going to be moving to Atlanta. So since he was my future husband, I decided to go with him to Atlanta and I found out about Shepherd Center. Um, and actually before that, I did an internship. I always thought I was going to do pediatrics, pediatric physical therapy. There's one problem with pediatric physical therapy. I hated it. What's one thing that, that, that comes with pediatrics? parents. Their parents come with the kids. And I was deathly afraid. I'm very much an introvert, which you probably would not recognize, especially if I cracked a lot of my jokes that I think are funny. Um, but the parents were just too inundating for me. And I'm a parent, so I can say that. So I decided pediatrics was not the thing for me. And I, in school, I drew the short straw to do a rotation at Jackson Memorial Hospital on their spinal cord injury unit and absolutely fell in love with it. And um, Maddie said in, in her introduction of me, just seeing somebody who uh, had a tragic accident, really could not do much for themselves, and watching them progress because of some of the things that I was doing and intervening with, that they could be a lot more independent. It was just extremely rewarding. So when I moved to Atlanta, I had an intern or a interview and the director of physical therapy said, you know what, Sarah, I'm really sorry, but we do not hire new graduates. I was like, oh, bummer. So I was looking for another more generic rehab program. And then I went to go get married. And while I was not in the process of getting married, but you know all those things you do before you get married, bridesmaids parties and dress fittings and all that kind of stuff. Um, the director of physical therapy at Shepherd Center had three physical therapy resignations. So even as a new grad, I was looking pretty good. Uh, so she called me and offered me a job and I took it and then here I am 34 years later. But the opportunities that came my way, one is the fact that they didn't hire new grads and I was ready to move on. Three resignations, that just happened. Um, and then along the way, for over the last you know, 20 some odd years, I, I practiced as a physical therapist for about 10 years and then started moving into management. Again, it really wasn't planned. Uh, people would retire and they'd say, hey, Sarah, you want to try this out? Sure, I'll try it out. Um, so the, that's how I continued with the various leadership roles. My last leadership role was as vice president of clinical services. And at that point, I'd been in the position for about two years. And they said, hey, Sarah, the um, CEO is going to be retiring. His name was Gary Lickney. He did a fabulous job for us for 22 years. Uh, do you want to be CEO? I went, hell no. I like making fun of whoever is the CEO, whatever decision they make. If it's a good one, I'm part of it. It's a bad one. I don't like it. And I'll just tell everybody else he's crazy. Uh, I don't want to be that person. Uh, but then after I had finished school, um, I started thinking, you know what? I think I can do this. And uh, they asked me about three years ago, again, would you like to be CEO? And I said, sure, let's give it a shot. Um, so far, so good. It's been two years. The building is still standing, in case you're wondering, and actually thriving and doing very well. The school part of it, <clears throat> why did I go back to school after 50? 
biggest recommendation out of today if you don't get anything. If you want to go back to school, do it before you're 50. Because after you're 50, it's just, it's not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> um, so go back to school uh, right away. But the reason I went back to school is I thought my husband was going to lose his job and we would have to move. Um, don't tell work that, but uh, that really was the original reason why I went back to school. Uh, but he didn't lose his job. We stay, stayed in Atlanta, and I ended up with two degrees, and that actually did help me get to this position as, as CEO. That's in a nutshell of how I got where I was. But what I'd like to do more importantly is show the slide of how Shepherd Center started, and hopefully you can hear it. It's an early morning, and, we have and you'll a see why, um, from a mission life. perspective, why and I stayed there for 34 years. Out on the beach and laying out in the sun, and I got hot, and I said, does anyone else want to go catch a wave? And, and no one else wanted to go in, and the third wave I caught was about 10 or 12 feet high. It collapsed into three feet of water. I can still vividly remember hitting the bottom and knowing I'd been stunned and hit the bottom and tried to push off the bottom and couldn't push off. And then the next wave went over and I couldn't kick off the bottom. And at that point, the fear set in of, I'm gonna drown. It was morning, and it was at 10 o'clock, and I was in the basement sanding on a brass bowl that we're gonna use in a fireplace and put rocks in and add fire down. And for some reason, Atlanta was still there, and so I, I, when I got this boy's message, I said, Atlanta, get on the phone. I was down in the basement, and I hollered up the steps to her. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's that call that you never want to get. You just never want to get it. And uh, I can walk down the halls here, and I can tell you a new parent. I mean, I can just, I can see him. I've been there, I look the same way. You know, it was the call that every family remembers who's ever had some family member injured. It's the call from hell. Entry happened October 21st, and December the 6th, we arrived at Piedmont. And they had already put together a team of doctors from a ortho group of orthopedic surgeons to a pulmonologist, a thoracic surgeon, neurologist, so they wanted to, to treat it as a team because they knew how complicated it had gotten. And we thought if we got back to Piedmont and our family and our doctors, everything would be fine. And it, was sort of fun. It was a pretty rocky road. I spent a few more weeks in ICU and had some respiratory arrest, cardiac failures. So it was a pretty, pretty rocky landing even coming back home. There was a lot of doubt about whether he would live or not, as, as you can imagine. So uh, we heard about the hospital in Denver and Harold went out there and looked at it and came back that same day and said, this is so different. Uh, it's really what they call spinal care. And so uh, he said, let's get out of here. And they said, oh, no, you can't possibly leave. No, 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 no. Uh, it'll be six, six or seven months. We need to build him up with blood transfusions and all that sort of things. And no, we're going. And uh, then they began to come around one by one to us and say, you're really making the right decision. And uh, they, it was just like you flipped the light switch. It was night and day. He began to move a toe and then a finger or so. And, uh, when we got out there, he was coming off his ventilator, and they began to pull all the tubes and get you knowing that there's some hope and a lot of intense physical therapy and so forth. So lucky that he was an incomplete entry, so he got return of function and sensation, particularly on one side, and he was able to walk out with a leg brace and a crutch. Well, that was a great day. Everybody says, you know, there should be something like Craig in the southeast. Oh, so, somebody ought to start something, and uh, yeah, somebody ought to start something. Somehow that somebody became us. <laughs> partner of mine, who was a friend of the Shepherds, knew they were looking for a medical director for something they wanted to start, and they, he gave them my name and they called me up and said, would you be willing to consider uh, starting a rehab center? Uh, and I knew it would go right from the start because there was nothing available within a short airplane or long airplane ride from Atlanta. You know, we begged every friend we knew and 
some that we didn't know too well for money to buy into this dream. And no one in Atlanta really understood what we were trying to do. So we're like, you know, would you make the contribution? You know, see if we can pull this thing off. And we started with six beds in August of 1975. It became obvious so quickly uh, that they didn't have the facility to cover all the patients' needs. It was so wonderful to go in where everything was brand spanking new, the rooms were fully accessible, <coughs> the facility was fully accessible, and, and we had a, a, a staff that knew how to take care of patients with spinal cord injury in an expert way. So just having your own home is, is a, was worth it all. And what's wonderful about this shepherd is it's not like a hospital. It's not depressing. Everyone has a smile on their face. It's really like they say, like a big family. Almost every day somebody stops you in the hall of the elevator and says, thank you for starting this place. Well, you know, I'm not the only one that started. There were four of us in the beginning and then lots more people were part of it. I couldn't do anything better with my life. It's been four years. We've got a few bumps in the road, but you're going to do that if you do anything that's worthwhile. I think one of the things that's most important to me is touching the people that come through the doors here and watching them leave with a smile on their face and hugging staff and saying how grateful they were to have been someplace during one of the most horrible times in their life. And they're ready to re-engage. It's just, it's, it's moving every day. That always gets me. Uh, you know, very much of a family-oriented uh, facility. I will say, you know, when Alana says she can't think of anything better to do with her career, that's, that mirrors how I feel as well. The Shepherd family is extremely uh, involved in the organization every single day. James is our uh, chairman of the board. Alana, the mom, still meets every single patient family member, remembers her names. I, I need to pick her brain and do a little uh, implantation in mine because she's like an autistic savant with names. She just remembers them, remembers her stories, their family names, her pet names, and remembers them for years. I mean, it's just uh, simply amazing. And everybody is still very much involved. Dr. Apple, our original medical director, is there pretty much every day as well. <clears throat> and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. But just realize we started with six beds, renting in a hospital, as you heard on the video, and now we're at 152 beds. Uh, we have added, since the time of the, the video, we have added not just spinal cord injury, but also brain injury as well. We just felt that that was a, a good combination with uh, catastrophic injuries. But we offer um, a lot of services for brain, spinal cord, and other neuromuscular disorders. Our average daily census is about 130, uh, so our capacity stays very high. Uh, two years ago, we couldn't admit 300 patients simply because of capacity. So we did grow, we added two new teams, and now we're uh, turning less people away. Now it's only about 75 for the entire year. Our average length of stay is very long, especially in today's healthcare world. You're, when you talk to an acute care facility, they measure their length of stay in hours. Uh, our average length of stay is about 47 days. Um, about 80% of our patients, looks like there's a typo here, 80% of our patients are male, not female. 20% are female. And that's simply because you guys are a lot more riskier than us chicks. Um, <laughs> so you tend to get injured more than the women. Uh, but we also offer day programs. Because of all the pressures we were getting from insurance companies to reduce our length of stay, our length of stays used to be 90 and 100 and 120. So we cut that to 47, but we did start some day programs, which essentially is what they're all the same program that they're offered on an inpatient basis. It's just done on an outpatient basis. But we have a, a multitude of various outpatient clinics, and you can read those there. And then some of our other services, uh, transition support, I'm going to talk about in a second. In 2008, we started a SHARE military initiative that helps servicemen and women post 9-11 that have PTSD as well as um, mild brain injury. 
You may or may not have heard the uh, statistic that 22 vets commit suicide a day. Uh, we've treated over 450 people now in that program since 2008. And we've had zero, super, uh, zero uh, suicides, so it's been extremely successful and one of the things we're most proud of. This is just showing you how many patients we see in a year. It's about 900. Uh, a little bit more brain injury than spinal cord injury. One, their lengths of stay are a little bit shorter. Two, the prevalence of brain injury um, is much higher than it is for spinal cord injury. Uh, but what makes us unique? You heard Dr. Apple talk about there's a lot of people that fly over some pretty good rehab facilities to get to Shepherd. Why do they come to Shepherd and not stop 100 miles before they get there? So these are some of the things that I believe make us very unique. One, we are a national provider. About 50% of our patients are outside of the state of Georgia. Our continuum of care, and you may not be able to read this back in the room, but we have a 10-bed ICU, we have medical beds, we have rehab beds, we have long-term care beds, and then we have all of our post-discharge, our outpatient clinics, and some health and wellness programs that we offer as well. You might be hearing in the news from a healthcare perspective, they're really trying to have people uh, have clinically integrated healthcare systems that can do soup to nuts. Uh, we're pretty close to that in just um, one building. So um, that's one value proposition that we have for insurance companies is, hey, look, once they get to the ICU, if they need to go to medical or they're ready for rehab, they don't have to get in an ambulance and go somewhere. They can just wheel down the hall. Some of the value added services that we have, we are very heavy foundation. You heard James that they had to beg, borrow, and steal from every friend they had just to start this dream. We're still beg, borrowing, and stealing from everybody we know and those we don't even know uh, to support all our value added services, which makes us so unique. One is housing, and that's a, the top right picture is a picture of our housing. It's 84 units. So if a family member lives more than 60 miles away from Shepherd, they get free housing while their loved one is there uh, for up to 30 days. And there's a problem with that because you just heard what my length of stay is. So that's going to be in my next section of my presentation with vision. But recreation therapy, so if a, if a patient comes in and they had any leisure interest before coming in or before their <coughs> accident, the goal is to get them back to that exact same uh, leisure activity that they were in. Or if they can't physically do it, then finding another one that they're just as excited about. Most rehab hospitals will have one, maybe two rec therapists, because it's not covered by insurance. We have over 33 uh, rec therapists, so we're very proud of that program. Uh, a very strong assist assistive technology, and we actually partnered with Georgia Tech uh, to develop, I, I know we've done several research studies. The most recent one that I can think of is for somebody who had to drive a power chair, you know, they usually use a straw that's placed in their mouth. But we all partnered with you guys and uh, created a tongue drive wheelchair so somebody could pierce their tongue um, and then through movement of tongue in their mouth could operate the wheelchair. And actually phase two of that is now they can control their environment as well. Turn on lights, head of the bed up and down, uh, control the temperature, get on the phone, those kinds of things. So it's really exciting and advancing the field. So thank you to Georgia Tech for partnering with us with that. Uh, our, we have 12 different sports teams. Uh, so once somebody leaves Shepherd, they're, if they're interested in sports, they can come on back uh, and join one of our 12. I mentioned the transition support. Again, this is an unfunded service uh, that insurance does not cover, but it's critical in today's healthcare world one of the outcomes that everybody looks at is 30-day readmission rate. So by the time somebody discharges from Shepherd Center, can they stay out of the hospital for 30 days? And that's a pretty routine measure that every hospital is measuring. The average national, the, the national average for readmission rate for the types of patients that we see is anywhere between 16% and 24%. So almost one in four go back into the hospital within that 30-day period. Last quarter, we were at 3%. Uh, so compared to the national average, we're, we're much better. And a lot of that is because of the transition support program, which follows those patients after discharge for up to 120 days. 
Uh, so they give them advice on the phone and hopefully keep them out of the hospital. We also have a patient equipment fund, so if there's anything that a patient needs and it's not covered by insurance, but it is medically necessary, uh, we have a fund that takes care of that. And uh, we also have pet therapy. There's dogs roaming everywhere. I said no to cats. Sorry, I'm not a cat person. Um, I'm allergic. <laughs> so, uh, but we also have horses. Uh, equine therapy, you may have heard of it, uh, the, the, that name. Now, we don't house the horses, horses at Shepherd Center. We, we partner with Chastain for that. But all of our value-added services, all of these that we do each and every day that makes us unique, Foundation has to raise $12 million to get this to happen. And then plus on top of that, you have capital campaigns because you, you, know, you need to build to go from six beds to 152 beds. So they do a fabulous job. We do have four directors of research, and for a 152-bed hospital, that's, that's pretty amazing as well. We have a director of multiple sclerosis research, brain injury research, spinal cord injury research, and then um, pharmaceuticals and devices. The device you see on the right, we worked with um, Vanderbilt uh, facility, Dr. Goldfarb, worked with him to create this exoskeleton that was then bought by uh, Parker Hannafin, and it's called Indigo, but there was a physical therapist at Shepherd Center named Claire Hardigan, happens to be my sister, that worked on the development of that. Now, has anybody ever been to Shepherd? A couple people? It's a very unique culture, and you saw a piece of it in the video when you know, James was talking about, you know, it's not a depressing place. People are smiling, people are getting back a quality of life. And that's taken many years to develop that culture, um, and the family obviously has a lot to do with that. But we at Shepherd, we wanna maintain that, so we created, well we didn't create it, and you may have heard of these five pillars before, it's actually um, Quint Studer. If you ever get into healthcare, read um, Hardwiring for Excellence, because that's a lot of the initiatives that we did take on. It's a, and it's easy to do. It's not things that cost a million dollars to do. So from our culture perspective, every meeting and every <clears throat> presentation, we talk about the five pillars, people, service, quality, finance, and growth. We put the people, per, people pillar, easy for me to say, First, for a reason, because we want people staying at Shepherd for 34 years. Now, I'm not gonna be there in 34 years, but I hope there's a lot of people who are there for 34 years. Our average tenure of our staff is eight and a half years, which is, again, is unheard of from a healthcare perspective. And from a leadership perspective, our average tenure is about 22 years. Um, so we have a lot of people retiring in the next five years, so if anybody is interested in learning about leadership, let me know. There's some things that we uh, really institute with our people pillar. Every month, and this again comes from Hardwiring Excellence, every month every staff member is met with to find out what's going well, what's not going well, what equipment and tools do you need to do your job, and is there somebody else you want to recognize? So we can keep that recognition uh, moving forward, making sure people are efficient. Now if somebody says I need this piece of equipment, it's a million dollars, that's going to take some time. But if it's something like a fax machine, if they ask for it on Thursday, they'll get it Friday. Um, so it's making sure that they stay efficient. But we put the, the other thing that we do is gain sharing. So if our organization meets, we have 15 different goals that I won't go over, but if we meet those goals, a certain percentage of our revenue is distributed back to the employees. Two years ago, we redistributed $1.8 million back to the employees. This year, we distributed $2.3 million back to the employees. So they're pretty psyched on that day. Uh, and then of course, if people stay longer, get the expertise they need, it'll be better service, it'll be better quality. We'll keep our financial uh, strength together because there'll be referrals and then we can continue to grow as well. So this is gonna be real quick. We have about a uh, little over 1,700 employees. Our overall engagement is about 88.7%. Uh, some of our leadership challenges right now is um, external staff, sh staff shortages, like physicians and nursing and even therapists. Luckily, we haven't experienced that yet, but we know we can. I mentioned about our succession of senior leaders. We have five senior leaders that are going to be leaving within the next three to four years. 
So we're really working on a very robust succession plan of who's ready to move up now, who needs more training, and what positions do we know that we'll just go external with. Uh, so we're working on that. And then millennials. That's got to come up from an old guy like me, right? There's, we've got to make fun of the millennials a little bit. Uh, and I'm not making fun of you, really. <laughs> but uh, our first year turnover used to be about 2%. Now it's 26%. And that's, that's been hard on our staff with constant specialty training. It takes three months to train a nurse before they can take a patient. Three months to train a physical therapist or occupational therapist before they can take a patient. So if one fourth of those people are always turning over, man, that can become very burdensome on the staff. So we're, we're, we're instituting a lot of initiatives uh, as far as leadership training, as far as uh, employee benefits to see if we can keep uh, that first year turnover much lower. It was as high as 35%, but now it's 26. Um, from a service perspective, and this is looking at patient engagement or patient satisfaction, our likelihood of recommending is almost always between 94 and 98 percent, which again, for a 47 length, day length of stay, that's, it's, it's pretty hard to keep somebody happy for 47 days. Where in an acute care facility, you, know, you can kind of muster up a two or three day uh, satisfaction length of stay, but we work very hard on that and there's a lot of initiatives and training that go along with that with the staff. Oh, I already said likelihood of recommending. And then from uh, outpatient um, overall care uh, is anywhere from 95% um, likelihood of recommending, sometimes is 100%, but usually runs around 98%. From a quality perspective, um, you know, one thing that we've seen from the healthcare world is the formation of all these different healthcare systems, right? So what we're seeing is people don't want to send their spinal cord injury or brain injury to Shepherd Center because they just you know, merged and acquired another facility and they want to keep it within their own facility. What we're seeing from that is the complexity of the patients that we see, the number of patients on ventilators, the number of patients who are now in comas, those really high, high intensity, high complex individuals. A lot of our patients now are, are that complex and that can become challenging as well. You've been hearing the news about infections, um, you know, infections leading to death. Our infection rate is about 25% below the national benchmark, but it's not zero. So we have some work to do there. And then from a growth perspective, we did add two new rehab teams, which helped us with capacity, obviously. Um, our SHARE military program has now doubled in size from being able to serve 10 people at a time to 20. And we also have had almost quadruple number growth with our newest program, which is our uh, complex concussion clinic. And you can imagine with everything that's happening in the news with football players. And it's interesting, we've had volleyball players and even swimmers. Go figure. Uh, I just show this picture, um, again, just to reiterate what our culture is like. We have an adolescent team that um, is below 18, but higher than 13 and they just did their haunted house. And I swear, they, they could be neck and neck with whichever other, I've never been to one, but it was pretty darn scary. Uh, they turned the fourth floor gym into a haunted house and uh, it was quite amazing. So here are just some top challenges, payment reform. I will tell you there is no bill, no legislation, no regulation. No payment reform that is having hospitals get paid more. If you've heard of it, let me know. I'll take you out to lunch. Be wherever you want. Dinner if you want. But uh, reimbursement's going down. That's all, that's all we need to say about that. Hopefully it won't go too low. The other thing about healthcare dollars, though, and healthcare costs, it's absolutely rising. We have to keep our staff. Pharmaceuticals are going crazy and out of this world, too. So keeping up with the payment reform. The healthcare laws, we have to maintain that. Uh, Shepherd is actually licensed as a long-term care facility um, and there's new rules with site neutral payments that again is reducing our, our payment. Um, I'm gonna go on. Oh, this is one of our challenges. 
and this is just an example of what we're hitting up against with some of the external world. So this was a presentation that was given to a hospital in Tennessee. And we have a lot of referrals from Tennessee. And this is what they told their staff. The title of the slide was Referrals to Shepherd Center. Therapists are not to inform patients that they would benefit from Shepherd Center. I mean, this is directly from that slide. We had some recon in there. Uh, therapists should always refer first to our inpatient rehab. You know, that's hard to compete with. Uh, luckily, our referrals are still about 4,000 a year, and we only admit about 100 a year, so we're fine with that. Uh, looking at Vision 2025, and this is going to be really, really quick, we want to improve access. People want health care fast, they want it now, and they want it cheap, but also very high quality. And that's what we're going to be working at from an access perspective, uh, like same-day appointments and outpatient. Uh, right now, in some of our clinics, we have a three, four, sometimes five-month waiting list. So we're going to really try to cut that, cut that down from a Vision 2025. And it's Vision 2025 because that marks uh, Shepherd's 50th anniversary. Best care, uh, again, talking about those infections and our outcomes and trying to make us very much differentiated from any other facility. But what we're really trying to do before 2025 is create what's called an innovative institute where people can come in and do several things. One, let's, let's review and look at new therapeutic approaches. So anything from a research perspective, we can get into the clinic much sooner. I understand that the average, you know, if you read it um, in some peer-reviewed articles, it takes 17 years to get from bench to the bedside. We want that weeks, not, not years. Uh, but looking at new therapeutic approaches, also looking at different mobility solutions. So if somebody wanted to try one of those exoskeletons that I talked about and I, you saw earlier, um, then they can come in and trial that or any other mobility device because we, we want to maintain and make sure that we have all of the equipment that people can try before they purchase it because some of these things are very expensive. Exoskeleton, for example, $180,000 and insurance doesn't cover it. Um, also getting a smooth transition to home. Again, 50% of our patients are out of the state of Georgia. So how can we make sure if they go back to Florida or New York or California or Colorado that we can keep them healthy and out of the hospital? Whoop. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, again, looking at expanding our discharge programming. And then also have a destination experience. Um, when, when I say the term uh, childhood cancer, what do you guys think of? What facility? What organization? I heard it. St. Jude's. Um, that's what I want Shepherd Center to be for brain, spinal cord injury, MS, and other neurological disorders is, is that it's top of mind. We have a lot of people that live in the state of Georgia that have no idea Shepherd Center exists. So if we can increase that experience and really make sure that it's top of mind when you need it, um, we're hoping that will help us with our capacity, which we're not having a problem with yet, but everybody's telling us we should be, and we haven't yet but we want to be prepared to make that room uh, move if we need to. Uh, creating smart rooms. So if somebody, for example, was paralyzed from the neck down, they could go into a room and say, turn on my TV. Kind of like an Alexa room. You know, turn on my, turn on my TV, you know, I'm hot, turn the temperature down, uh, look at their medical records if they want, call the nurse from there if they want, uh, but really looking at those smart rooms and how do you ga engage the patient um, even more. Um, and then again, creating the best place to work uh, for our staff. All right, five, ten. You were you were going. I just didn't see you. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of the vision um, in a nutshell. Also, obviously, what services we offer, and then if we went back a little bit further, um, my personal story on how I got here. Uh, so now, any does anybody have any questions, comments? Hi, how's it going? My name is Daniel Loom. I'm an undergraduate student here at Tech. Um, you had talked about how your first year turnover uh, went from 2% to 26%. And I was wondering like, what sort of time frame that happened and like, if you have an idea. It went uh, from 40%. That... Oh, 40%. It was, four... oh, was 2% until about five years ago. 
And then what happened with Atlanta and traffic? I mean, it's just crazy. I think a lot of the construction that's on Peachtree, I mean, it was taking people two hours to get to work when it would normally take them 40. So we were losing a lot of people at that point. Um, so I think that's one reason. I think another reason is, you know, millennials in general, I'm not labeling anybody, uh, in general, you know, want to keep moving. And with leadership that has been there 20, 25, 30, 40 years, you know, sometimes the upward mobility may not have been perceived at that time. So I think a lot of those uh, events led to as high as 40 percent, and then what got us back down to 26 percent is really focusing more on management training, giving managers the toolboxes that they need when a new person starts. You know, what do millennials like when they first start a job? Well, they really like mentoring. I mean, that's what uh, the research is showing us. So we have, we've assigned mentors to all uh, new staff, millennial or not. But we, that's what's gotten us from the 40 back to the 26, is a lot of management toolkits for our managers. Um, and then we think the gain sharing keeps people there, at least until August, when we distribute it. You have to be there to get the check. And then we have a lot of resignations the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you, you mentioned that when you started, uh, they weren't hiring undergrads. Do you guys hire undergrads now? Well, from a physical therapy perspective, uh, there's no, uh, it's all DPT. It's all doctoral level. So um, we still hire undergrad if they exist. All of them are my age, though. I mean. I was on the cusp of bachelor to where physical therapy then went to master's program. And then from a master's, we now, uh, from a physical therapy perspective, require the DPT. Uh, so, but we do hire them from just graduating from the DPT. I think from an occupational perspective, they're going that route, but right now they're just master's level. Um, speech, I think, is still undergrad, I think. And nursing is still undergrad. So yes, we do. If, if the profession has that ability. Thank you. Thanks for holding this talk. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I assume that family care is not reimbursed? Correct. And, that's correct. So uh, do you find that family involvement, given the uh, 30 days that you allow or um, ends up helping the uh, outcomes of the patients? A absolutely. Everybody hear the question, I'm assuming? Um, absolutely. In the, in the 30 days, a family can use that any way they want. It does not have to be consecutive. So if they want to come for two weeks and then go home for two weeks and then come back, they can. Also, we do have other sleeping arrangements if they want to stay at the hospital. They're just not an apartment. Um, and because we feel that the family involvement is so critical and extremely important, and that's what our families say, uh, we're actually looking at purchasing some land relatively close to Shepherd Center and building another family housing unit so the family can stay there for their entire length of stay. I was actually meeting with, we have a consumer advisory council that I was meeting with today and going a lot more in detail about what our vision 2025 is. And one woman, her daughter was there for 14 months. Well, she slept in the room for 14 months, so that tells me she didn't get any sleep. So to me, it's extremely important, not only for the family, but also for that patient, that their family member and their loved ones can be there and involved in care from the very get-go. I remember when I took my son home, I almost you know, had, an, <laughs> had a stroke because you, know, you thought this little kid was gonna be easy and I, I probably needed 20 pages of directions. Imagine something as complicated as a brain or spinal cord injury. So it's important to be involved with that care all the way through. And that also helps the patient, too, um, feeling more comfortable about going home if, if they need assistance. So, uh, and to your point, so hopefully they can stay in our apartments and get rest, because they need that as well. The second thing is we do offer counseling and uh, support groups for the families, because they're going through a lot as well. Yeah. My question might be related a little bit to that. Um, a few oh. years back, we had the, uh, I think the CEO of Children's here. And Donna. one of the things that she did was she really praised her staff because 
the environment's a tough environment. We have very sick, uh, terribly ill children. And it can kind of get, get to you. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, it seems like you'd have a similar type of situation at Shepherds where uh, these individuals are suffering very traumatic um, uh, types of energy, in, injuries, but you indicated that the culture seemed to be somewhat upbeat. And I was, I was wondering how you were able to create that culture given the, uh, I guess, the severity of the problems that your customers have. And secondly, is there anything that you could suggest that could be transferred in terms of how to create up, upbeat cultures in, in, in like, a, like a regular for-profit type of organization? Um, what was the first part of the question? Uh, how do you do it at, at Shepherds in terms oh, of uh, deal, dealing with the fact you have such seriously ill individuals? How do you, how do you keep everybody's spirits up, so to speak? Well, I will tell you, I'm going to, uh, you know, the people that have been there for so long, one, one of our values is humor, which um, can sometimes backfire. But I think for the most part, um, it's just, one, it's very much started with a family. It was a very, very small six beds. Um, very highly complicated, obviously, and you know people had to get the experience and all that that they needed. And I think what happens now is because it was so family oriented, we're still very much family oriented. And you heard how much that Alana Shepherd, Harold Shepherd, James Shepherd, Dr. Apple are still there and helping maintain that culture. A lot of it will come from the hardwiring excellence books that I highly recommend because it's, it's rounding with the staff. I go on the floor all the time. I've never been on the floor and they go, uh-oh, Sarah's here. Um, I'm interacting with the staff. Managers are interacting with the staff. The staff are getting what they need. Uh, also, if we've been through a rough time, because there's a lot of times where uh, you know, we might be staffed for 135 and we have 138 patients, so people are really working hard. We recognize that immediately and try to do some things like stress busters. We had um, like a family feud, which is kind of pretty funny, um, where you know we'll do things for the staff, dinners, stress busters with family feud or $1,000 pyramid. We'll also, uh, that rounding that I mentioned has been incredible in maintaining a culture because if the staff feel like they get what they need when they need it, they're happy. Um, and then I will also say 100% of our staff, I say without a doubt, drives our mission of our organization. And that's to help people with brain and spinal cord injury, whether it's temporary or permanent, get back to their lives again, a quality of life. Um, and they see that and they experience it. And the patients also, um, like for example, our adolescent program, these patients are writing on a whiteboard uh, tips of what to do when a new person comes in and everybody's reading this board and some of them are motivational, some of them are pretty darn funny. Uh, I probably can't tell you all of them, but uh, there's some, yeah, well, whatever. Um, but it's, it's just everybody working together for that mission, making sure the staff have what they need, making sure the staff are recognized. Um, you know, we were, we were voted the, uh, top 10 of Atlanta's best place to work, which was nice. Um, but it's just everybody really working together for that common mission. From the environmental service staff all the way up to our physicians and another executive leadership. Everybody is on the floors rounding and making sure that the staff have what they need. Oh, well, the haunted house is a perfect example, right? So um, everybody all the teams that were there went through the haunted house and you know it's just it is what it is we have um comedians coming in we have uh you know a lot of donors too do patient cookouts and things like that i mean it's it's really hard to explain exactly what we do because we do so much um but the fact that we're putting our staff and patients first i mean Everybody knows if, if, you, if a patient or family needs something, that's going to be our primary. Every decision I make from a growth perspective or a team perspective or an FTE perspective or equipment perspective, the patient and family are a true north in that decision, and everybody knows that. Um, and then, again, the, the staff, we want to maintain our staff, uh, and we do everything we can. And the rounding, to me, is the, probably the initiative that really keeps the staff engaged. 
if they see that we see that they're having a tough time because they don't have a fax machine and they get a fax machine the next day, there's a lot of satisfaction and reward to that. So I have a question. Thanks for being here. Uh, I was curious about the recreation therapy. Uh, yes. You said you have 33 recreation therapists, whereas other uh, rehabilitation centers have, you know, very few of them. One, so maybe. can you talk about, you know, the, the purpose of the therapy and, you know, why the emphasis um, is on that? And I'm also curious what you said it's not... Um, covered by insurance, right. so is that like an out-of-pocket cost for patients if they, you know, pursue that specific therapy? No, um, not an extra cost, because that's through our foundation. Our recreation therapy department to maintain that every year is about $2 million. And if you, if you look at the importance of rec therapy, and let me just even start back in the very beginning, Dr. Apple, who's our medical director, funded the first two recreation therapists out of his pocket because he felt how important it was. You got, this is a little classroom participation here. Name what some of your leisure interests are when you're not in school. What do you like to do? Shout them out. What? Not drinking. <laughs> Hiking. Hiking. Name another. Yeah. Reading. Reading. Skiing. Skiing. Dance? Sports? Anybody get into sports? Bowling? So the, the importance of that is after a catastrophic injury such as brain and spinal cord injury, people think they can't do these things anymore. I'm not going to be able to golf. I'm not going to be able to fish. I can't um, bowl. I can't dance. Our recreation therapy department gets them back into those specific interests again. And if for whatever reason they can't, then they find another interest. We have, so every patient is assigned a recreation therapist that goes over what were your leisure skills and let's see if we can get back to it. So if you're paralyzed from the neck down and on a ventilator, how do you read again? How do you bowl again? How do you dance again? That's what our rec therapy department does and it's so integral. A lot of times from a rec therapy perspective, that's the first glimmer of hope a patient has. Oh my gosh, I can get back to that. You know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy can get boring. But uh, when you get to rec therapy, if I can get back to the things that I loved to do before my injury, that's what I want to be able to do. So every patient is assigned a rec therapist. And in addition, we have six other specialists, again, all donor funded. So if a patient has interest in, I don't know if I'll be able to do all six quickly, um, music, art, horticulture, sports, outdoors, did I say aquatics? Aquatics or art, I, I'm sure I said that one. But they'll get an additional rec therapy sessions, again, to make sure that they can get back to the things that they loved to do before they were injured. And even some additional things that they didn't know they could do after their injury. Um, so what is your decision-making process when it comes to balancing the pressure to reduce costs and length of stay, but also increasing quality of care? Like, how do you manage that tension between business and medicine in your everyday decisions? Uh, well, looking again, patient and family mm -hmm. is our north. Uh, the one thing that I've guaranteed our staff, and I hope I can keep this, and so far I have, is that when we're looking at costs, let's look at the costs that we can cut that does not affect the quality. If we lose our quality, then we're just any other rehab facility. And that, you know, obviously that, that could be um, devastating from a business perspective. But we're, you know, we look at things like cell phone. Can we change a, car uh, a carrier? We're looking at supplies. Well, if we went to a, a, a similar supply um, and it costs half as much, those are the kinds of things that we're really looking at. Or is there another more effective way to deliver the same quality of treatment, like telemedicine? Um, so that's what we're looking at. I'm not looking at, uh, we've been very fortunate. We haven't cut any education. We're, we're very committed to our staff's education. So everybody in the organization has opportunity for, uh, you know, growth from an educational perspective, whether it's through conferences, whether it's through tuition reimbursement, 
whether it's through professional development funds. Um, we really try to develop uh, the staff into that as well. Um, so luckily we haven't had to get rid of any of that. But it's really maintaining, we've got to keep our quality up. And I'm not willing to cut costs. Now if we're forced to, all right, that's something else. But we haven't had to, had, had to do that yet. Another question I get asked often is, why don't you expand out into other types of injuries? You know, why just brain injury and spinal cord injury? Why not burn or um, artificial um, joints or cardiac or whatever? Well, I'm not going to do that. That is going to, we are a specialty niche and we're very good at what we do with brain and spinal cord injury. And again, if we make ourselves like any other rehab, then, then we're probably not going to be in existence anymore. But it's really trying to look at the, the low hanging costs as opposed to the quality specific costs. All right, I think we have only one more question that we can ask. So um, it looks like you have so many moving parts to make your organization successful and it's very successful. I'm curious, so you said, you know, we don't want to enter into other injuries because this is our kind of specialty. What do you think about how replicable your model is in terms of you know, creating another specialty center somewhere else? You know, I've been asked that several times. What's so hard is without the entire entity, you can't replicate it. Um, we tried to replicate just ourselves, and this is us doing the training and us, you know, being very much involved in the development of this, we tried to do a little outpatient satellite clinic in Tennessee. But because it didn't have everything, it didn't have the pool, it didn't have all of the rec therapists, it didn't have the same services and the same opportunities, it just didn't work. So unless you pick up this entire facility and plop it somewhere else, you know, and it took us, you know, 43 years to uh, figure it out and to grow this, you just can't replicate this anywhere else. We've also been asked um, by quite a few people, and I know Choa has done some of this as well, is have our staff run whatever rehab facility at that other healthcare system. Again, without all the resources that we have, we just felt like it really would weaken our brand, not strengthen our brand. So we've, we've toyed with it, we've looked at a business plan for it and have decided not to. <laughs> Yeah, and you guys are awesome. My nephew went to Georgia Tech. Great, thank you. <laughs>